Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. In the next half hour, then, we'll see what's making the headlines with the Observer's chief leader writer, Sonia Soda, and the communications advisor and former aide to Boris Johnson, Gita Harry. Welcome. Great to see both of you. Lots to talk about tonight, certainly. So let's check out the front pages first of all. Uh, Queen back in the office at 95 is the headline for the Metro, following Her Majesty's first speech since the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. Plans to introduce voter ID measures in the UK risk excluding over 2 million voters. That's the lead story for The Guardian. The Financial Times has details of David Cameron's repeated attempts to lobby government and Whitehall officials on behalf of the collapsed finance firm Greensill Capital. The paper alleges the former Prime Minister sent 56 sets of messages. Though the eye puts that figure at 47. According to The Telegraph, the government will publish a digital duty of care bill which could lead to social media firms being shut down if they fail to protect children. One more papers coming in. Uh, we'll take a look at those when we get them. Sonia Soda, Gita Harry are here. Um, a pared down demonstration of what a Queen's speech would normally be like. But uh, what about the bills put forward themselves, Gita? What did you make of it? Well, I think it's pretty impressive, first of all, that the Queen can go back to work, you know, after COVID, the Queen can go back to work after real terrible personal grief and at her age. And actually, it was a pretty packed programme. There's no room here to accuse the government of having run out of steam or not having any ideas. But what's, what's fascinating is the different directions in which they go in and the different uh, types of things that are being addressed. And that's where people are struggling to put a sort of coherent narrative around this, other than this general idea of getting Britain back on its feet and levelling up. Great to see the Queen as well, um, you know, back, back in her day job, effectively, but without all the regalia, um, so soon after the death of her husband. Um, but let's move on to what was in and what was out of this. Um, many people, and much of the focus is on social care, which leads to a, a leader in the Financial Times. What, what's their take on this? So the leader in the Financial Times is really focusing on what the Prime Minister has said is going to be his priority over the next two or three years, which is what he calls levelling up. So reducing the regional inequalities between areas of the country like London and the South East and the rest of the country. And what the FT is doing in its editorial column is really asking whether there's enough meat on the bones in terms of what was in the Queen's speech. And they express some quite serious doubts. I think they're right to. So first, the first big kind of levelling up thing is oh, well, we're going to be reforming uh, planning to increase the number of homes being built. Well, that's not really, you know, the price of homes is not really the big issue, actually, in, in sort of less affluent parts of the country where house prices tend to be cheaper and planning reforms don't take us very far there. The other sort of measure in there is around extending loans to people to sort of con with lifelong learning. So if you want to retrain later in your career, um, if there's a sort of growing industry, you'll now be able to to get a loan to do so. But actually, I'm, I really don't think that goes far enough at all. I think there need to be bigger subsidies uh, for people to retrain. So I think there are a lot of gaps um, when it comes to evening out regional inequalities. And that's something that the FT has identified in its editorial column. And I think that really relates back to a much bigger criticism of the levelling up agenda, which is that the government has talked about this since 2019. In fact, Theresa May talked about it long before then. But in terms of actual measures. It's, this seems to be more rhetoric than reality. And then if you actually look at which areas of the country have benefited the most uh, from the last decade of spending and which have been impacted most by spending cuts, it tends to be the less affluent areas of the country. So I think at the moment, it still feels a lot more like rhetoric than reality when it comes to um, pledges for reducing the regional gap. Yes, and as, as one commentator suggested today, this whole idea of levelling up, they've now got to find policy to fit a soundbite that played well in focus groups. Is that where we're at now? You've got to find something to deliver this. I think there's more to it than that. There are personnel who need to level up. There are people in number 10 and the policy unit, uh, Boris is chief political advisor, the prime minister's chief political advisor. These are people who are from the north of England. That's not been the case with governments or of left or right. You haven't had a whole swathe of Conservative MPs from these areas in the past with an incentive to get re-elected. So that's going to be a big dynamic. 
And I think the Prime Minister is very sincere about wanting to do this because it, it's, it's a political imperative for him. It's something that he thinks is wrong with modern Britain. You need to do it to reduce the burden. You need to find all kinds of things to get the economy purring. But the FT are quite right to sort of hold the government's feet to the fire and say this has got to be translated now. They're not really questioning the sincerity of the aim at this point, but they are asking for flesh on the bones and they're right to do so. Uh, the Mac cartoon, uh, Sonia, retirement home for politicians who used to say they were going to reform social care. I mean, in some respects, we feel like we've been here before. Theresa May got her hands burnt, clearly, didn't she, ahead of, uh, uh, of the election she fought. Um, am I being naive to say the reason they dodge it is because it's just going to cost us, the electorate, and whatever happens, it won't be popular? No, I think you're spot on there, Anna. I think we've not seen politicians brave enough to come up with reforms for older care for quite some time now. And it was actually, you know, way back in 2010 that Andy Burnham uh, back then proposed a fairer system to pay for social care and the Conservatives attacked it. And, and really it's become so politically toxic since then, the issue, that politicians just seem to shy away from it. At the heart of the matter is there's this fundamental gross unfairness in our system. This is a big missing thing in the Queen's speech. Um, you know, if you get cancer, your care costs are met by the NHS. If you get dementia, the vast majority of people are going to have to end up paying for very, very expensive personal care that would be covered by the NHS if you've got cancer from their own life savings, uh, from selling their house. That really isn't on. In fact, if you take a step back, the, the arguments for the principle behind the NHS, which is free at the point of delivery to everyone who needs it, they, they apply even more to social care because it's even more unfair and people are less likely to sort of save to pay for social care in their older age during their working years and they are even to pay, you know to pay for their own health care during their lifetimes so it's it's really depressing because we've had so many reviews and commissions on how to pay for older care um, in the last sort of decade or so the vast majority of those reviews come up you know, the answer they come up with is we should fund care for older people in the same way that we do for the NHS. It's completely crazy that you get your, your care costs met if you get cancer but not dementia. It's totally ageist and unfair. But we just don't seem to have the politicians who are willing to just say, absolutely, we get this. Like politicians did back in the 1940s when they were setting up the NHS. You know, back then, if, if, that, if the politicians had shown the same level of courage as these politicians today, we literally wouldn't have an NHS. Maybe it's just crept up. What's nice about that cartoon is it reminds those politicians that it's not that far off. They may think there's decades until they need social care. In fact, for politicians in their prime, it's going to come up. It's going to sneak up on them much sooner than they think, and they'll be in a retirement of themselves. So it's a nice little reminder of... Um, uh, this thing needs to be sorted even for their own benefit, not to mention the rest of us. Yes, and Gito, The Guardian picks up on another issue which is proving controversial, which is this idea of having to prove your ID for voting, um, uh, suggesting that it will freeze out over two million voters. Many people suggesting those are less likely to be Conservative voters. So what's your feeling about this? Yeah, I, I have to say, I think that's utter nonsense. You know, if people are not able to vote because they haven't got ID, the problem is not that they can vote without ID at the moment, but people need an ID that they can use for all kinds of other things in life. If they haven't got an ID that allows them to vote, then think of the other things they're missing out on. So instead of coming up with some gerrymandering kind of insinuations, which is what's essentially in that sort of Guardian story, then address the issue of the people out there who are dispossessed by not having the right ID or not having the right paperwork, not having the access to the right uh, services. There's a bigger agenda there if there's that many people who really cannot vote uh, because they don't have a way of proving who they are. Yeah, we've got so much to talk about, haven't we? Let's uh, we'll just take a break and come back with all the other subjects, including they've proven controversial in America, um, that ID story. We'll also talk about Lex Greensill too and uh, his evidence today ahead of David Cameron's appearance later this week.
Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview. With me now, Sonia Soda and Gidja Harry. Let's just show you the sun, shall we, before we get more of your thoughts. Uh, body dig at West Cafe. Uh, their front page. Cops began digging for a body yesterday at a cafe where the serial killer Fred West was a regular and did building work. So that's their focus for the papers. But let's go on now to the Financial Times, which is the start of these hearings, which will be a fascinating week, isn't it? We're expecting to hear from the former Prime Minister David Cameron on Thursday. Uh, Sonia, what do you make of the evidence we heard so far from this Mr Greensill and his capital firm? So, yes, the sort of big story tonight about this is, first of all, his evidence. But I think the even bigger story, actually, is some of the evidence that the Treasury Select Committee, which is conducting this inquiry, has put out into the public domain. And what that evidence reveals is that Cameron was actually lobbying probably even more ministers and top civil servants that we, than we thought and harder than we thought. So, you know, he was sending in the realm of kind of like 50... He sent in the realm of kind of 57 messages, emails, WhatsApp messages to various very senior people in government, including ministers over quite a short time span. And actually, it's, it's kind of embarrassing for him um, more than anything else as well, because he sounds a bit desperate in some of the messages, to be honest. He's clearly pushing really hard for the interests of this company, which he's a paid director of, having been prime minister. And I think, you know, for a lot of years, there's, there's it's you know, there's quite a lot of complications and complexities in this story. But when you take a step back, what you need to know is that somebody who is prime minister has gone into a very well-paid directorship role at a company, and then they are pushing ministers, senior civil servants, making use of, of these personal relationships to try and get changes in government policy for this financial services firm that they're waiting for, that they're working for that's uh, that David Cameron was working for and he didn't succeed in getting what he was asking for specifically but Greensill did benefit from other government contracts and schemes. So I think this does really expose the fact that former ministers, you know, going to, right to the very top, David Cameron, former prime minister, there just aren't enough rules governing what they're allowed to use, their personal relationships that they developed through working for the British government to, to achieve for the corporate sector, which okay. is, well, you know... Yeah. And Bad money for taxpayers. Yes, I, we're, we're running out of time, so I just wanted to get Gito's take on this. You, you know, working in the in the Prime Minister's office and all of that sort of stuff, the full scale, the eye tells of, of David Cameron's behaviour at the start of the pandemic. I mean, these people have got other things on their minds, haven't they? That's kind of the point too. Indeed, it, it is embarrassing. It's also in, in 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 a bizarre way, and perhaps not in very flattering way. Very very impressive. Some people who uh, knew. But David Cameron, as a chillaxing prime minister, very prone to delegating very effectively, we very, very impressed by the, you know, the big shift that he put in on this one, the hard yards. He actually did a massive lobbying job. I think what people, most people, and I've spoken to some people involved in some of the inquiries, in the end, they're not sure that there's a breach of rules here. They just think it's grubby and that it's really not on. And when you've got those contacts, when you've got that sort of standing, when you've got that authority that David Cameron had, even when he left office, you could surely have put it to better use for humankind than this kind of lobbying for you know, corporate benefits and a massive sack of gold at the end of the rainbow for yourself. And that, I think, is you know, what's, what's the shameful legacy for him, uh, unfortunately for him. Yes, and just quickly, Gita, where might this head, do you think? Simply new rules or what? Well, it's hard to tighten the rules so that you can't talk to people that you know and all the rest of it. In the end, uh, people I've spoken to are looking into this. They say you've got to see beyond the sort of sensationalism of how hard you know, Cameron lobbied and all that. The problem only arises if there's a genuine conflict of interest for a person in power. And the real problem here in the end is not the elected politicians, because there are rules that you know kept Cameron out for a couple of years, for instance. But it's civil servants who had feet in two camps, people who are controlling vast multi-million, maybe billions of uh, pounds in government, but also seconded to private companies. That's got to be where the focus ends up. OK. Quick 30 seconds. Daily Telegraph's lead story about a duty of care bill, the idea that social media giants could be shut down if they don't look after children properly. Well, quite right. And I think there's an experience here. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sonia, go on then. <laughs> I was just going to say, I actually think some people will be really surprised that this is the first time that, you know, massive fines are being proposed for big platforms like YouTube that don't even implement their own age guidelines. So I think this has been a really, really long time coming.
OK, brilliant. See you at both at half 11. Thank you both very much indeed. Gita Harry, Sonia Soda, thank you.